Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for the weekly comic book review. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups. This is the weekly comic book review. It's the show where I read a lot of comic books, and I'll let you know what I thought about them. And we always start with the pick of the week. This week's pick of the week, The Nice House on the Lake, number one, from DC Black Label. This was a phenomenal debut from writer James Tynan IV and artist Alvaro Martinez Bueno and Jordi Belair on the coloring. This book was super cool. It's the first part of a 12-issue series and it's, I don't know if it's necessarily creator-owned, but it's definitely not based in superheroes. So it's James Tynan stretching those muscles that he stretches over at things like Say Something is Killing the Children or Department of Truth when so on and so forth. Um, Alvaro Martinez Bueno, they actually worked together on Detective Comics and I think a little bit on Justice League Dark, if memory serves me correct. This is some of the best artwork I've seen from this cat. He already has excellent composition, great double page spreads, but when you add in Jordi Belair on the coloring, I absolutely loved the artwork in this. It's very ominous. It's very foreboding. It's got this nice deliberate pace to it. What it is, is about this loosely connected group of friends. They're loosely connected by this one dude named Walter, right? And he all has, he's invited them all to the nice house on the lake, right? And I don't really want to spoil, but let's just, I don't really want to spoil anything, but let's just say that this dude's kind of got this weird, creepy fascination with the end of the world, and then he invites these people over to this house, and then he 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 drops something on. Let's just say that. This book was freaking awesome. The way that it paces the story out, the way it keeps you completely intrigued and engaged through the strength of the characters and the enticing mystery that slowly builds until the end of this book it reaches a perfect crescendo. This was an excellently paced, excellently executed, incredible, just a fantastic debut issue. This is how you do an issue number one. You set up mood, you set up character, you set up pace, and you deliver a punch and a hook that's going to have me definitely coming back for issue number two. The Nice House on the Lake. There you go. Lots of coolness in that issue. Crush and Lobo, number one. It's the first part of an eight-part miniseries focusing on Crush. If you're not familiar, Crush is Lobo's daughter. I'm not super familiar with the character. That's basically all I know about her. Um, she was recently utilized in the most before the Infinite Frontier Teen Titans type stuff, and I didn't really read that, right? But this is promising a reunion of sorts between her and her father, Lobo. Well, she's not really into Lobo. This issue was okay. The artwork was pretty cool. My favorite part was Tamara Bond villain on the coloring. The coloring on this was really, really fantastic. I am not already a Crush fan, so this really delved a lot into her personal life, which I guess that's okay, but I'm just not that familiar, but I guess the inter it's point the point is to be an introduction. I found myself really waiting for Lobo to show up, and when Lobo does show up in this issue, I kind of got excited. So I'm excited to see where this goes. I think artistically it was really strong, and it was a decent first issue and a decent introduction to the character of Crush. This is definitely probably more for new school fans over Lobo, old school Lobo fans, but we don't know what's going to happen when the main man fully shows up. But Crush and Lobo, number one, out this week. Then we got the Batman. That's right. The Adventures Continue Season 2. So much like what came before with the previous eight-issue series, this is a continuation of Batman the Animated Series by Paul Dini um, and Alan Burnett. Ty Templeton. Ty Templeton's been doing artwork on Batman animated stories since the 90s. So this is a veteran team that knows what they're doing. And what they're doing is they're introducing more modern concepts this time around like in the last series they did the whole death of Robin Jason Todd Red Hood they did Deathstroke they did Azrael things that they left out in the initial run and this one they're starting to go into um, the Court of Owls there's also a dead man appearance that's pretty cool um, if you like the previous series you're gonna like this one 
It's the exact same thing. It's a continuation, and it's introducing the Court of Owls. A little bit different than the Snyder Capullo run, but just perfect for that animated series vibe. So I liked it. I thought it was strong, and I'm going to continue following this one as well. Speaking of Batman, we have Batman 109 out this week. This was a fantastic issue of Batman. I really like what James Tynan's doing here. We had DC Future State. We saw the Magistrate. We saw this no-mask order in Gotham, and they're hunting down Batman and other vigilantes and they're introducing the magistrate and the peacekeepers and all that stuff. Well, you get the full-on introduction of Peacekeeper 1 here. And even though DC Future State is not the definitive ending of all of this, so it gives you the sense of the stakes and at the same time, the uncertainty on where the story is actually going. Jorge Jimenez, once again, along with the coloring by Tomu Mori, kills it on the artwork. Great perspective, great big wow factor moments. There's also a really nice bit in here between uh, Harley Quinn and Ghostmaker and some interesting revelations about Poison Ivy and her past, but the artwork was fired. There is a backup story in here. Um, like I said, there's some great Ghost Maker Harley Quinn stuff. Uh, the backup story in here just is not enticing me, and I want to know more about Ghost Maker. He's an interesting enough character. He gives me definitive feels of like Phantom X or something like that. Um, so I'm intrigued by this book, but still it's just slowly developing, slowly building. But we're building up to Fear State. We know where the end game for this is at least heading to her, the next step, I should say, and we know it's right around the corner. Batman confronts Simon Saint as it's shown on the cover, and Peacemaker one makes his appearance. Batman 109, another super solid issue. The next Batman Second Son, issue number three, the penultimate issue of this series before John Ridley and Travel Moore Foreman continue on the journey of Jace Fox becoming the next Batman in the next series, I Am Batman, which debuts in August with a number zero issue, right? Anyway, this one's all right. This one is finally revealing what happened in Jace's past, why he had to go away, why he got sent to military school, why he didn't want to come back to the family, why he has a different opinion of his father than what we may have having been Batman readers for a long time. And that's one of the interesting things about what John Ridley, the writer, is doing with the characters of the Fox families. He's able to show a new light, a new spin on a character like Lucius, who for the most part has been kind of a one-dimensional figure in the Batman lore, but now is definitely well more rounded out, including his family. I'm actually very excited to see where this is going. We got a little bit of action here. It just feels like the pace runs a bit too slow sometimes. Maybe the dialogue's just a bit too clunky. Not clunky's not the right word, but just maybe there's, it just doesn't have a nice flow to it. And it kind of, I think, hurts the momentum of the story. But that being said, still some interesting concepts um, and twists being played with, with Jace Fox, Tim Fox, Luke Fox. So geez, Tim Fox and Jace Fox, same person. Anyway, next Batman, Second Son, number three out this week, The Swamp Thing, issue number four, Rom V, Mike Perkins, Mike Spicer. This book is phenomenal. It's a fantastic tribute to everything that came before in Swamp Thing, but is blazing its own unique perspective and vision going forward. We got a new Swamp Thing being introduced. He's still learning the ropes. This is the issue where he fully connects to the green. If you're familiar with previous Swamp Thing runs, you know that that's an important issue and it's important to hit the dramatic and emotional side of it as well as the artistic side of it. And I think Ron V and Perkins and company absolutely nailed it. I love this book. I love this character. It's a little bit of a slow burn, some might say, but at the same time has a momentum and a pace. It's just moving the story along right as it should. I'm in love with this book. I'm in love with Levi. I'm I'm just, I'm, I adore it. The Swamp Thing number four of 10 but this book's doing well. If we keep pushing for it, I think we're going to get a season two. So that'd be super, super cool. Justice League number 62 is here. Um, $4.99 issue, two stories. You got a Justice League story by Brian Michael Bendis. Um, and it's okay. The introduction full on into uh, the Justice League of Hippolyta. Maybe she's not becoming an official member here, but here we go. Um, it's all right. So dealing with some lingering things from the Naomi book, which makes me question, are we getting Naomi season two? Probably for sure, since they're doing that TV show. Um, but, you know, the Bendis and David Marquez stuff, it's all right. It's decent, but it's not really wowing me. It's not doing anything different. I feel almost like it's got the exact same structure. 
Um, and, and as like Bendis's early Avengers work, and it feels almost like you just plug in the Justice League and you kind of tell the same stories and the same personalities and the same uh, interpersonal conflicts. That being said, the backup story by Ron V and Zermonico um, is the Justice League Dark story, which I'm just loving. This is introducing this new uh, or a, a different take, I guess, on Merlin, at least as far as I'm concerned, but I really, really like it. It's foreboding. It's got this nice, deliberate, slow pace to it. It's got a density to it, and I'm very impressed with what Rom and company can do with just 10 pages in the back of every issue of Justice League, making it, to me, the highlight of this issue. Just League 62 out this week. Then we got Green Lantern issue number three. Yo, yeah, I was not sold on the Green Lantern number one, but I liked number two. Some big things happened and I liked issue number three. The biggest thing that happened, I don't really want to spoil it yet in case you want to get caught up, but there's some craziness that's just happened to the Green Lanterns. And this has got one story that's focusing on Jon Stewart in the aftermath of the craziness that happened in issue number two. And then the next story is about how the core is trying to coalesce around uh, in unity around the threat that happened at the end. There's a lot of like political schemes going on. There's a mystery about who's responsible for this catastrophe that's been set upon the Green Lantern Corps. You got a nice, the, the, the Jon Stewart story is decent enough. It's okay, but it feels kind of familiar. You know, we've seen this kind of story a lot. However, I'm really digging what's going on with, uh, was it Sojourner Joe uh, from Far Sector? I'm really digging with what's going on with the core right now and 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 all the, the stuff with how it's related to the, entering the United Planets. I, I'm i liking this Green Lantern book. And then the ending, the ending got me even more excited. Green Lantern number three, pretty solid. Suicide Squad is here with issue number four. This book is just going to wind up being kind of like a a silly fun book. I don't know. I mean, I'm going to keep reading it for now because I'm actually rather enjoying it, but I wouldn't say that this book is necessarily exceptionally well done. The artwork feels a bit stiff at times. The story is a bit wonky. In fact, the characters make very irrational moves at times and it just comes, things come out of nowhere and it just feels more melodramatic and soap operatic and things like that, right? That being said, that's some of the best stuff about comic books. And I actually kind of dig this book. I'm digging the mystery. This is continuing the crossover with Teen Titans. Titans. You don't have to actually have read, I guess, what's going on. They'll catch you up, but this is Red X against the Suicide Squad, and I got a new theory for Red X, and I really hope it's not true, because if Red X was Tim Drake, that would really bother me. That would really bother me, but there was one line of dialogue in particular that made me think that in here, and it's got to be someone we know. Is it just some random person that we don't? Who knows? I don't even know if I care. Just wake me up when they let me let everybody know who Red X is. Uh, Crime Syndicate number four is here. You know, I've not been liking this book. This issue was no exception. I do like the focus on this Jon Stewart version of Power Ring. It's interesting. It's a little bit different than the typical iterations for Power Ring. I actually like the Jon's version a little bit better, but this was okay. I guess it's serviceable. It feels like the, this was what Crime Syndicate feels like to me. Because what it is, is it's a reimagining of, of Earth 3 and of the Crime Syndicate, basically the evil Justice League, right? It's a reimagining of this world. So it's like a, a reboot almost, if you will, okay? Uh, and it feels like this is a reboot from the 90s. Like, and that's like, and not in a good way, right? And so I, Crime Syndicate number four. Whack, I didn't really like that one. Sensational Wonder Woman number four. This one had a pretty decent story. I'm trying to refresh my... Oh, yeah, I, I, I actually like the story in this one. I think it's using a Wonder Woman character, like old school Wonder... I don't, I'm not familiar with the character, but with the highlight is Danny. Danny on the art. That's right, the artist of Coffin Bound. That's right, the artist of Low Low Woods did this issue of Wonder Woman, and I am absolutely just enthralled with the artwork. I see a lot of dark stuff from Danny, obviously. I mean looking at the books that she's worked on, but this had a really nice uh, vibrancy to it, even though it also still kind of had this darkness that I thought was appropriate to the story. I love the layouts and composition. Like the story itself is just okay. It's not gonna wow you. It's decent, it's average, it's okay. But the artwork, the artwork was so amazing. That was awesome. Danny on Wonder Woman, yeah. Yeah, like if, is it Travis Moore? If Travis Moore has to step away from Wonder Woman, the proper title for a second, Throw Danny on there, please. Man Bat is here with issue number five. This is the final issue. Um, this book was basically, if you started reading Justice League Dark, Man Bat was fully like, he was still Man Bat, but he was still fully like Kurt Langstrom in his head, right? This was the story of how that happened. 
right? How he goes from the man bat that you typically know to this man bat that was in Justice League Dark, which it seems weird to even make this book at this point because it's designed to fit in a hole from several years ago that most people probably have kind of forgotten about, but whatever. It's been a fun book. It has really great um, insight into the character of Langstrom, Man Bat, what's going on there, his marriage, Batman's relationship to all of it, um, his connection. Great artwork by Sumit Kumar. The, the final issue felt a bit rushed for me, not as solid as the artwork in issues one, two, or three in particular, but it did really scratch that Man Bat itch and it perfectly sets it up. So if you were that person who was like, I just don't understand why Man Bat's like this, this is that story and it's a really pretty solid Man Bat story. Issue number five, the final issue out this week. Batman Catwoman from DC Black Label is here with issue number five. I'm still liking this book, but the way that it's structured, because you've got a story in the past, story in the present, story in the future. Kind of. Right? Kind of like that. You've got three different stories and three different timelines in this world in which Batman and Catwoman stay together. I don't know if this, you can't even look at this so much anymore as you can look at it as Tom King's last statement on the Batman-Catwoman relationship, but not so much as a continuation of his Batman run. Right? Um, but it does introduce the phantasm in exquisite way like i love the art there it's got some wonky moments in the story and in the artwork i would say that clay man this one is the weakest out of all of the issues but there's some great moments with the phantasm and i like it so it's just the way it's jumping between these three stories and because it's not coming out very regularly it feels a bit disjointed and now's the time almost halfway through to already sit down and kind of refresh but i'm not going to do that till issue six comes out because it has been a bit late here lately the conjuring the lover number one this is from dc horror a brand new imprint i guess to do licensed horror properties or their own stuff probably i don't know probably more licensed stuff if i had to guess but this of course is the conjuring there is a third conjuring movie coming out this week so this is uh i don't know if it's necessarily supposed to fit in between like it's giving you information i this is not going to be essential i am certain to that movie um it's got a great bill sinkevich cover uh, the story itself is okay. It's got some nice gnarly moments with the artwork, but it just doesn't feel like it has the pace appropriate to a comic book. I'm not familiar with the writer, so I don't necessarily know if it was written by someone who has written comic books, but it just feels like it was more something written for the screen and, let, and it just didn't feel like it fit. I don't know. There were certain things technically about it that I just thought were quite amateurish in the script, but that's just me and my estimation on it. There is a backup story though by Scott Snyder that was pretty solid. And it's about one of the items in the Warren's like, you know, basement museum or whatever the hell it is. You can make that story go on forever and ever and ever. But the Ferryman story at the end by Scott Snyder was pretty decent. So hardcore Conjuring fans, sure, check it out. But if you're looking for something special, if you're looking for something unique, if you're looking for something essential to your Conjuring viewing pleasure, I don't think you're gonna get it from there. Now let's head to the Hellfire Gala because we have Marauders number 21, which kicks off the Hellfire Gala, which of course is the X-Men summer blockbuster crossover type thing. And let's just get this out of the way. I'm gonna let you know this. I would not suggest the idea that you have to read every single one of these, okay, to get the idea of a full story. What's going to happen, at least what we can tell, we got three issues out this week. We got Marauders, we got X-Force and we got Hellions. They all are dealing, Marauders is kicking it off. This one feels a bit more like this is the opening of the Hellfire Gala. Here's the problem. They promise a big giant change, right? And then they reveal the change and we see the characters kind of responses to it, but they never tell us what the big thing is. So this sets up the Hellfire Gala, okay? And it does it really well. And if you're a Marauders fan, I think you'll like it, but it doesn't actually deliver anything outside of that. That's going to be held, I think, for Planet Size X-Men, which is like the big one shot in the middle of all of this. So I would say this, all of these books are just kind of like preambles into the big thing which will be revealed in Planet Size X-Men. And then I think the stuff that comes afterwards will be dealing with a little bit of shock and aftermath of it, right? If you look on the back, you'll see that certain ones are in red. Those are probably the most important ones, I guess, but I mean, I, you, if you weren't already reading Marauders, I bet you could just read Planet Size Action. That being said, the issue itself is pretty solid. It's pretty decent. It's interesting. It's $4.99. It's got a little bit of an extra size story, but it also reprints some Hellfire shit from like back in the day. That's 
that's that's that's I don't I don't know if I like that. Like that's like okay, we're paying for that though. Like nobody asks for that. Um, the Hellfire Gala though is basically Emma Frost trying to get everybody together, all the leaders of the nations, all the mutants, and and to finally work it out. All the nations that were withholding agreement deals and the treaties with Krakoa, they want to like they want to unite it all and, and get it all done. And that's kind of what's set up here. And Emma does something that's big and game changing. But like I said, they don't reveal it in this issue. So it's kind of infuriating. It's kind of infuriating. I'll be honest. X-Force. This focuses on the opening moments of the Hellfire Gala and what the X-Force are up to. And it does delve into some of the beast stuff that's been building up. So each of these are going to be kind of be focusing on their own story. This one's going to directly continue into Wolverine. Okay, because it's, it's a Benjamin Percy one as well. There are scenes... Um, in this book that are straight from this book, just more elaborated upon. None of it is essential, I think. Like, if you're just reading what you like, just continue to read what you like. Don't feel that you have to get every single one. At least they didn't even label it part one, part two, part three, because that's not what it is. This is a one-night event, and the revelation is going to happen in Planet Size X-Men, I'm sure. And the start of it was in Marauders. This is what X-Force is up. That's going to continue into Wolverine, and it was a pretty decent issue. It was okay, but it does... At least the whole story is not completely getting sidetracked because they're actually dealing with some of the ramifications from what Beast has been up to. And then Hellions number 12 is here. Um, the Hellions, aside from like Psylocke and Havoc and Sinister, weren't invited because they're kind of like the misfits. They're the, you know, they're the misfits of the uh, Krakoan uh, way of life. Um, so they crashed the party, and this one was fun. This is exactly what we've come to expect out of Hellions. Just a wild, rambunctious time. Um, ridiculous. So much fun. You get to see <laughs> Nanny getting completely freaking drunk and just wiling out. I, I freaking loved it. Hellions number 12, that was great. Even if you don't care, give two shits about the Hellfire Gala, Hellions will still not disappoint you, for, for real. Heroes Reborn is here with issue number five. This is the Nighthawk-centric issue. We now know that these are all going to be a series of one-shots, along with various one-shot tie-ins. None of it is essential. None of it has been essential. In fact, I would dare to say that the only essential factors, if you want to know the actual story, complete, middle, and end, would be the first issue and probably the Heroes Return one-shot that ends it all. Anyway, that being said, this is a reimagining of Nighthawk way more in line with Batman. Uh, Luke Cage is his Commissioner Gordon. Uh, Green Goblin is his... Green Goblin is his Joker. And you could kind of say that Falcon's his Robin. Falcon's his psychic. That tells you a little bit of that backstory. Um, and this was okay. It had some really solid artwork. It's It's got a raw, gritty... Uh, feel to it, nice texture, but basically he inherits Spider-Man's rogues gallery. Um, some interesting changes and stuff. So if you're liking this, if you're liking the one shots, focus in on each of these characters in this world and the slow, you know, mystery that is evolving about like who's responsible. We all know it's Mephisto because they just keep laying that all out there. But anyway, here's her board number five was pretty decent, but it is still kind of mind boggling to have an event that's just a series of one shots that are really not that essential to everything, whatever, you know, it is what it is. American Knights is one of these Heroes Reborn one-shots. This one's actually not too bad. <clears throat> you let It lets you know what Matt Murdock's up to, and, and it focuses a lot on Luke Cage, who, like I said previously, is the Commissioner Gordon of Nighthawk's pseudo-faux-Batman universe. Anyway, American Knights was actually kind of okay. Marvel Double Action has got the story, and it's done very old school, like with Dan Jurgens' artwork and everything, but it, this is the story of the death of Falcon, because instead of the death of Gwen Stacy by Green Goblin, it was Falcon, um, and it's just weirdness, right? But this is the comic book act story of the events that they relay to you in Heroes Reborn. It's okay. It's okay. We got the Iron Man Annual. This kicks off the Infinite Destinies thing, which I talked about on the weekly pop culture wrap-up and said since it's being put into the annuals, I didn't think this was going to be too big of a deal, and this really wasn't. So, what it was, was Iron Man goes on a mission, and he meets up with Quantum. It turns out that Quantum is one of the people possessed by an Infinity Stone. That's right, they're stones now, they're not gems, and they, they possess people. So, he's possessed, Quantum <clears throat> is possessed by the Space Gem, so he can teleport. It's just a one-and-done Iron Man story that introduces this character, and then there's like this Nick Fury story at the end that there's going to be in the, all the other ones, right? So there's a series of annuals, and they're each going to focus on a hero meeting one of these stone-possessed people. So the next one is Captain America, for instance, meeting 
I don't know, what's his name? It's the Time Stone guy or whatever. So anyway, it was okay. It's, it's honestly, if you're just like that hardcore about Infinity Gems, Infinity Stones, and you want to know exactly where they are at this moment, you know? Because this has been one of those mysteries that they kind of like, ooh, who are these people? And then they kind of dropped it, and now they're like, oh, someone's like, oh, man, we got to get to it. Anyway, eh, Infinite Destinies is... Eh. The problem is they're all one-shots, right? So I'm going to feel like I got to read them. Anyway, uh, Mortal Hulk number 47 is here. We're nearing the end of Immortal Hulk, and it's not quite picking up for me. I feel like it should... I feel like the events in this issue, which is basically Hulk versus uh, the Avengers yet again, um, from the perspective of, of She-Hulk, and there's some great moments in here that are cool and some setups, but it feels like we've been taking too long to set some things up. It's really time now to let it deliver and let it deliver full on out. And I feel, I, I'm sure we're about to get that, but Immortal Hulk is a book that I've liked. It has been a bit inconsistent overall for me. I think if this was shrunk down maybe to 40 issues as a whole entire run, Maybe it would be a lot leaner and meaner and punchy. That being said, this one to me felt mostly like a throwaway because it felt like the whole point of this issue was to set up one thing that's, that's important for the narrative. That being said, I thought it could have been handled a little bit better. Mortal Hope 47, though, still okay. Amazing Spider-Man 67. I knew it wouldn't be long until Nick Spencer gave me an issue of Amazing Spider-Man that I just absolutely hated. I hated this issue. Once, okay... $4.99. Why? No reason. No reason. I mean, it's a bit longer. No reason. Okay. It's the start of the chameleon conspiracy. Okay. Do you remember when Peter thought his parents were still alive back in the 90s and then they died again? It turned out to be this all this plot. Chameleon was involved. Do you remember that? Remember how exciting that was and how you want to go back to that? Yeah, exactly. Nobody really wants to go back to that, but it is a kind of nice nostalgic pull to people our age, or at least my age, right? However, this was so dull, so boring, it was kicking up so many plots that are not connected to any of the plots that are still dangling after 70 plus issues of this book, because don't forget about the point issues, right? So we're not getting to that. We're introducing all these new things, and none of them are interesting. None of them excite me. The art was stagnant and just stiff. Hey! Hey! I actually feel like things are right with the world again because it's an issue of Amazing Spider-Man I can't stand. Issue 67? <sighs> anyway. If you're liking it, I'm glad you are. Savage Avengers number 21 is here. Um, I'm glad to see this book post-King and Black tie-ins back to business doing what it's supposed to do. Conan after this sorcerer, was it Kulan Goth? Something like that. Patrick Zercher on the artwork. Ugh, clean, clean, crisp, exactly what it should be. Big, nice, fun stuff. Conan's been shacking up at the Hellfire Club, so he's got this, like, pimped-out suit. It's really nice. Um, and this is mostly Ghost Rider versus Conan. It's a very quick, brisk, uh, easy-going issue. It doesn't have a whole lot to it, but it is starting to set some things back up. I feel like this book's about to hit a point where we'll, we shall be past the point of no return. Anyway. Let's jump over to Aftershock. Out of Body, number one. This is from Pete Milligan. I, I do like Pete Milligan. I like most of his work. Some of his work I don't really like. This was a really cool concept. This is about a dude who was attacked, and now he's lying in a coma. Uh, he's uh, being kept. He's on life support, and he's completely aware. So he's, like, narrating this from his body, and he's trying to figure out what happened to him. He was attacked, right? Meanwhile, there's this, like, psychic out there somewhere who can contact this this spirit kind of stuck in the middle, right? And, and it's him, and she's trying to sense him. Meanwhile, this dude's lover shows up, and, and they're, they're doctors, and, and they're doing, like, uh, like, like uh, they're psychologists, right? And they're doing, like, therapy sessions with, like, psychedelics. And so she gives him the psychedelic to either help him pass on or help him find his way back. And after that now, he is completely disconnected from his body and he's out of body. He's like in an astral form floating around. Then you got to... It was actually really well done. Uh, the way that the story enveloped um, was really interesting. The way that you kept getting clues about who this person is, what happened to them, who's this other woman, what's her connection, what's going on. And then you get to the end and Pete Milligan is a veteran at this. And he knows what he's doing and he thought he did a really good job in Out of Body. Um, the artwork is done by Inaki Miranda. That's the artist, of course, from We Live. So if you like the art in there, I think you're going to like the art in here. Um, I liked it. I thought this was really cool. It, was, it had a nice, slow, deliberate pace to it, but it delivered. It delivered. 
Basilisk number one is here from Boom Studios. This is from Cullen Bunn, Jonas Schwarf, Alex Gomares. Um, this is, was an interesting issue. It was actually well done. Okay, the composition, the pacing, the script, um, the dialogue, it all flowed. It all had a nice flow. The problem is it didn't really ignite a hook or a concept in its first issue. Now, if you read the solicitation, it's about these, 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 this group of people called the Chimera. And they're like super villains or something. They're connected by a hive mind, right? And one of them went rogue, okay? And when the one who went rogue, who's the lady we see here on the cover... Um, when she is found by one of her former victims, uh, somebody connected to a former victim or something, she now joins up to fight against her former evil teammates. It's not like superhero -y or nothing, but it doesn't really deliver that, that in this first issue. Like, it's a really good first issue. It's got really great pacing. The dialogue, everything about it is very nice. It's punchy and it moves right through. And you get to the end, though, and you're kind of like, what was this comic about? That's... See, that's a problem with some of these first issues, and Cullen Bunn's a really good writer, and I trust him. I feel like this story's going to go in a really good direction, especially knowing the solicitation. But some average person off the street that, say, hasn't watched the weekly comic book review and hasn't read the solicitation, if they pick this up and they read it, they may not want to come back. you got to deliver me a better punch at the end to bring me back in. And I just feel like there was a lot left unsaid in the first issue of Basilisk. That being said... It was a well-executed issue otherwise, technically. So Basilisk number one, we shall see. By the way, I hear rumors that that is Cullen Bunn's biggest opening ever. So that's really cool, because he is a very solid and consistent writer. Firepower is here with issue number 12, kicking off this third arc, I guess, because the first arc was the trailu uh, the Trailude, Trade Paperback Prelude. Trailude? What's a Trailude? We've created a, no a whole new bit. Hey, Trailude. Anyway... Uh, Firepower number 12 is a big climax, right? So we had that big battle in the last one, and it's an exercised issue, so it's $4.99, and there's a bunch of covers out there for it for some reason, but, like, I it was a good issue, <clears throat> excuse me, and it was a really good wrap-up to the, the story. But what's crazy is I was expecting, like, more action, and then the action kind of, like, ended rather briskly here. Like, it kind of, like, wraps up. Now, I think when you read it all together in a trade, it's going to have a really nice flow to it. So this is more resolution, but what I loved is that he took the time for resolution and it still had energy. It still had a kinetic vibe to it because of Chris Sammy, Matt Wilson's artwork. The artwork in this book is awesome. The characters are hitting a point. And I really felt like, whoa, I, is, this story, is this story wrapping up? But the, just enough is left open for its return next month. And no, firepower ain't going nowhere. And I'm glad because this book is action packed, high octane and just supremely energetic, like literally just shocks you when you touch it. So good. Firepower number 12 out this week. Noctera is here with issue number four from Image Comics. Scott Snyder, Tony Daniel. Um, this one's all right. You know, the artwork's still solid. It's still some of, I think, Tony Daniel's best recent work I've seen, especially with Tomu Mori actually really helping uh, three-dimensionalize it. Um, with the coloring, um, but the story's got to get to a point. Now, it gets to a little bit to a point here, but there's sometimes Scott Snyder stuff, I get bogged down. I feel like certain pages are a little too heavy in the flow, and they hold it back, and then it's got some great action scenes that move the story forward very briskly. I just don't feel like it's balanced, at least, at least in issue number four. I don't feel like it was balanced as well. That's the other thing, though, is maybe it works out those kinks in the trade for me. But anyway, Noctera number four, still a cool concept. It's about a world where everything went dark and everything starts turning into these gnarly, like, monsters. And the only way to stop this infection is to douse yourself with light, which is impossible unless you have electrical light or something like that. But in a post-apocalyptic world, that's crazy. So it's got some nice energy and it's got some nice flow to it. But at the same time, that flow gets a little bit held back at times, I think, um, by... Just I, just, just, I think that some pages are a bit too weighty and they hold things back. You get what I'm saying. I said it enough. Noctera number four, though, still pretty decent. Still pretty decent. Family Tree is here with issue number 12. This is the final issue of the Jeff Lemire Phil Hester story that I have been ranting and raving about. This book has been amazing. It's a book about this girl who turns into a tree. Okay? But it, develop, it, it, it develops into this, like, post-apocalyptic, military, crazy thing, but with this striking chord... Of, of, of family and the importance of family and connection and, and those you love and, and sacrifice. 
And then this is the final issue. And man, I know it's been a while since this came out. And I'm going to have to reread it all. But wow, was I freaking lost. I was so confused. I was so lost, so confused. I, I guess I barely remembered what happened in the last issue. But I did remember. But I was just, I was lost. Like, I got what happened. I understood it. But I was just like, that seemed to come out of fucking nowhere. But anyway, that's just me. Family Tree number 12, though. For a book that was super solid from a writer I really, really like. I am going to sit down and read them all again. I'm interested in knowing what you thought about the finale of Family Tree, because that one, for me, kind of like just came out of freaking nowhere. Hollow Heart number four is here. So this is about um, this science experiment, just a bunch of organs and gas and, and, and fluids like in, the, in a mech suit, right? Um, this creature is being kept in this facility and basically lives this tortured existence. And then one of the people who works at this facility... Um, kind of falls in love with this creature and they develop this bond, this relationship. He helps him escape. And now that they have this life of freedom, L, who is the monster, is... And I, I don't want to say monster, but L, who is this creature. Um, things start going sour in a really creepy and maybe brutally real kind of way. I really like this book. The emotion that uh, Paul Tucker can show with the artwork is astounding to me. What Paul Allure can do with telling a story in the midst of telling a story and how they can thematically intertwine, I think this book is fantastic. Hollow Heart number four, loved it, totally worth it. And from Dark Horse, we have The Worst Dudes number one. This is a new one from Aubrey Citizen. Tony Grigori. Aubrey Citizen is the writer of uh, Beef Bros, which is a freaking awesome Kickstarter, and uh, uh, No One Left to Fight. So The Worst Dudes is the sci-fi romp kind of thing that's about like the worst people in the galaxy going on this mission together. It was hard for me to actually piece together the story or the thread or get into the flow, um, but what I did like about this book is that it ain't afraid. This book is wild. It's got, it's trying to be irreverent. It's trying to be crude. It's trying to be rude. And there are other books I think that do it and handle it a bit better. There's something about this that just felt a bit off to me, but it was still kind of enticing. I like this world that's been imagined. I like these characters. Um, and I'm excited to see how Citizen and company develop this story as it goes. The Worst Dudes, number one, out from Dark Horse this week. Then we have the finale of Dead Dogs bite <clears throat> excuse me uh dead dog's bite number four from uh it's tyler crook right tyler boss tyler boss tyler boss um this story was really interesting it's kind of like this twin peaksy type mystery this town that's kind of anchored by this peppermint company and the mystery of these missing people and this young lady's like trying to find her missing friend and she un unravels this conspiracy about this town but when you got to the end like i just thought that it was kind of a dull boring and not really that exciting of a revelation it didn't really have the punch for a book that was so stylistic so intentional about its choices i just was kind of like mm, all right i guess that's cool but i just didn't quite get the punch. It just didn't quite stick that ending for me. Um, but Dead Dog's Bite has had some amazing artwork and some really intricate structure. Um, and I was just a little let down by the events of the ending. But that's just me. Dead Dog's Bite number four out this week. Then we got Young Hellboy. Um, the Hidden Land issue number four this is the final issue of this series. It's not going to change your life. This book ain't going to turn you into a Hellboy fan if you ain't already. But if you are, it's always fun to get a glimpse into Hellboy's past. That being said, it's just a bunch of like gorillas and, and like this giant like bat like and they're fighting and and young hellboy that's what it is and that's not trying to be anything more than that and so i applaud it for that young hellboy the hidden land issue number four from scout comics we have by the horns issue number two it's been a while since issue number one came out but this book picked up right where it left off amazing artwork and a really cool story it's about this woman whose lover was killed by mad insane unicorns and now she is out to hunt unicorns down right so she gets the idea of where she could find some and let's just say it doesn't go quite as planned so it's uh 
It's a nice fantasy book, but it's got some really interesting characters. It is incredibly well done. The artwork is great. You got this guy, this one thing, he's just a giant eye, floating eye, but so much character thrown in there. So it's fantasy, but you know, I'm not the biggest fantasy fan, and I love this book because I love well-made and well-executed comics. It's got action, it understands pace and flow, and from the first page to the last page, it was just an exhilarating ride. By the Horns number two, Check it out from Scout Comics. If you missed out on issue number one, there is a second print available right now. And Vampirilla, num 1992, number one, it's one shot. Two reasons why I read it. I feel like I want to get into Vampirilla. Why not? This seemed like something I could do. This is a one shot, 1992. And secondly, it's by Max Bemis, right? So let's check it out. So I did not like this book at all. It's intending to be a goof on 90s extreme comics, you know, TNA, legs, hair, all that kind of stuff. But it just... And it's trying to blend it with something else, something a little bit more creepy, a little bit more gritty, a little bit more real. And it just was so off and so wild and so weird. Like if I, so it just didn't do it for me. Just did not. But I, I'm asking you out there in PCP Army and in YouTube land, if I really wanted to sink my teeth into some Vampirilla and get into the character, what should I read? What should I read? Should I read the priest stuff? Should I read older stuff? What should I read? Let me know. I'll seek it out. Maybe. Maybe we can do a Harris Comics in the 90s or something. Who knows? I don't know. Anyway, that's what I read. That's what I thought about it. What are you reading? What are you digging? Let us know in the comments down below. We do still have exclusive sets available of Blood Skulls and Chrome number one. Jonathan Lau, Ghost Rider, 1973 number one homage cover commissioned by us, sold only by us. You can only get these things here. Black and white version and a colored version for $24 plus $6 shipping. If you want one, email us, popculturephilosophers at gmail.com. And also be sure to like, share, subscribe, all that jazz. Join us at popculturephilosophers.com for podcast blogs and a whole lot more. I've been rocking Robbie Billups and be sure to check me out on Jim Mint Collectibles when we do our weekly top 10 coming up this week. I've had a lot of comments. People ask me where my top 10 video went. Well, I took some time off of it and now I'm doing it with my partner in crime, Jim Mint. So check that out over at Jim Mint Collectibles. We've already released a few of those videos, my favorite comic books of the week and his, and we talk about them, compare and contrast all that. Anyway, we really do appreciate it. Thanks for rocking with us. I've been rocking Robbie Billups. Keep on reading, stay strong, keep living, and station.